Good evening, HPMI family. I pray you are all well and in good spirits. I am so honored, excited, uh, privileged to be with you all again to share with you all what God is saying about church growth, right? This is an exciting, exciting topic for me. I am extremely passionate about this. This is what is uh, waking me up every Sunday. This is what is driving me during the week, uh, driving me on Wednesdays. Uh, it, be beautiful, beautiful, beautiful topic. And I believe this is what is extremely close to God's heart above everything, right? We know that the, the, the last words of Jesus Christ uh, were, Go ye therefore into all the world uh, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all these things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Um, another version says, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples of all men. And this is the key to church growth, right? This is one of the the, 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 the driving factors of, of church growth because we know that it was the last thing that Jesus said. And there's something powerful about the last thing someone says, something powerful about that last word. That's why even the courts take it to consideration. If someone was to die and the last thing they said was, Yasha killed me, <laughs> they would take it as, a, as, as truth, as fact. Okay, so it is important. We need to understand that that was close to the heart of Jesus Christ, so close to him. This was what was important to him. And that is why we are passionate about church growth. Forgive me, I'm already going into it. That's how exciting this subject is to me. Beautiful, beautiful. Anyway, so my name is Yasha Chiriseri and I am the pastor of HPMI Kairos Church. We are a youthful, vibrant, budding church that is located in the city inside Harare Gardens at Theater in the Park in Harare. We are a church that is growing. Apostle P. Chiriseri always says anything that is not growing is dying. And we refuse to be a dying church. We are a church that is full of life, passionate about the things of God, passionate about being relevant with the gospel, passionate about teaching and baptizing all nations. Exciting stuff. Exciting. Beautiful. Beautiful. Praise the Lord. So as we get started with this word today, and I'm going to share very briefly um, and, pretty, and go pretty fast with this, but allow me to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. May it be sharper than a two-edged sword. May it not fall on hard ground or on hard hearts. Lord, may it change lives, transform minds in the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Beautiful. Beautiful. I just want to thank my apostle and leader, an amazing leader, Apostle Petunia Chiriseri. Thank you for this platform. Thank you for what you are doing at the ministry. Thank you for allowing us to do these teachings, which we know will build the church, but not only the church, but will build families, communities, the, the, uh, the cities that we're in and nations. Uh, we truly believe that. I truly believe it. And uh, thank you also to the amazing uh, leaders and uh, of this church that have been consistent, that have been loyal, that have been pushing the work of the ministry. Uh, I love you guys so much. Love you. I am inspired. In fact, the only reason I am here is because of seeing what you, um, ha you guys have done. Uh, so I appreciate you guys so much. So here we go. As we get started, I just wanted to touch briefly on on one of the principles of church growth that Pastor Lisa talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and I'll start off with a little story. It, th th this principle here changed our ministry completely at HPMI Kairos. So if you guys don't know, HPMI Kairos is a youth church that was birthed from um, high school ministry and campus ministries, right? We, we had started uh, an amazing uh, 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 high school ministry where we would go out to different high schools across the country, share what God did for us, how he transformed us, how he changed us, uh, talk about all the mistakes that we made on a practical level, on a relatable le level as young people. Um, and God sort of just took over and, and, and grew the thing. Uh, 
The other founding factor was campus ministry, which HPMI had a campus ministry. But what we did was go in there and revamp it, uh, re revitalize it and and planted a number of campus ministry branches in a, a number of universities um, across the country. <clears throat> so this is where HPMI Kairos was birthed, having young people in a place where they can connect with God, where they can connect with one another, where they can be passionate, where they can uh, express themselves um, while having transformational change happen in their lives. HBMI Kairos was literally birthed with these two founding factors. Okay, that being said, we started the church off with eight founding members, okay? I think nine, but so we, we had nine of founding members in the church, okay? We didn't start a church with a number of people. We started with nine, <clears throat> Okay, what we then did was invite the students, high school students, uh, 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 university students to join our ministry. <clears throat> and as we went, it was extremely vibrant at the beginning because we started in the month of November in 2019. Uh, with a lot of passion, we were busing our university students into our first location, which was a theater on Nelson, on um, Robert Mugabe in town, <clears throat> okay, in the city. And so we were busing in uh, or picking up our students, our university students. And this had our numbers looking pretty good for a startup church, okay? We were, we were there and would have 30, 40, maybe 50 members at times, depending on the week, for the first couple of weeks, two weeks, okay? And we, we thought we were doing well. We really thought we were doing well. So one of the things that we realized as we were going through these first couple of weeks, these growing pains, was that the funding and finances were entirely on me as the pastor, okay? And one or two leaders at the time, two leaders at the time, who were able to actually contribute to our rentals, all right? Having to deal with things like fuel and transport money, that sort of thing. Okay, so we, 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 even though we thought we were doing well, these were some of our growing pains and struggles. Okay, <clears throat> the tithe and offering because it's students wasn't very strong. And so everything was on the, these two or three leaders at, at the time, every, every single uh, month or week. Okay, <clears throat> one of the other shocking factors to us, which hit us as a new church, was as soon as the students were finished with exams as soon as they were finished. <laughs> that same Sunday, because many of our students were students from out of town because they didn't have a church to fellowship with uh, and their churches maybe didn't have a campus ministry or have a church in, in Harare. So they were always a student. A lot of them were from out of town. But that next Sunday when exams were finished and schools were closed, we came back to <laughs> our beautiful budding church we were so excited about and we were looking at almost the exact same number of people that we started with 11 12 people <laughs> oh boy did that discourage us it really discouraged us on top of the fact that as the pastor the responsibility for rentals and making everything happen was on me okay uh, of course these two or three leaders who would contrib contribute uh, financially uh, it would help but again the responsibility was solely on me all right and I, I i remember even as we went on the couple of months as we went on to january and february um, the church still, we still had growth. We decided we wanted to evangelize and get more students back in. And we kept preaching and, and, and evangelizing and witnessing and, and follow-ups and so forth. That, that uh, grew the church again. <clears throat> but what didn't change was the strain, the financial strain. I remember then having a conversation with one of my mentors about this because I was getting a little frustrated, getting a little tired, exhausted and wondering when is God going to come through? When is God going to come through? And I remember him clearly saying to me, clearly saying to me this, and, and this is where I'm going with this family. Okay, I want to tie this in with what Pastor Lisa was talking about and touching on those weeks because this transformed our ministry. But this mentor of mine said to me that there is a beauty in having a youthful church. You will have passion. You will have energy. There will be life. There will be vibes. Vibes, as some people will call them. Okay, there will be groove in the church. <laughs> 
for the young people, you know what we're saying, right? Right? It'll be an energetic church, right? You will not have a problem with doing with, with implementing things, with 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 doing evangelism and trying new things, right? But there's advantages and disadvantages for having young people, okay? And he says, an old church, there's the, the advantages are, or an, an, a more mature church, not an old church, forgive me for saying that, a more mature, a more mature crowd with mature Christians. There, the advantages are, you are not worrying, you, you, you have people who understand the word, all right? You have under, people who understand principles and concepts, all right? They'll be consistent, they will be strong, they'll be, you know, uh, uh, they, they, they'll be uh, um, uh, really focused on uh, some of the things that you're doing in the church, okay? But here are some of the disadvantages of both. With young people, you have energy and passion, but you have young people problems, right? Lots of sinning, <laughs> lots of fornication, lots of drinking, lots of clubbing, <laughs> lots of issues that will follow you there, okay? Uh, with old people, the problem is, or older crowd or more mature people, okay? With an older church, more established church, what happens is that they are harder to move. They are harder to move. It's harder to implement things. There's no passion. There's no energy. It's harder to get people to go out and evangelize and do some things. So each one has pros and cons. And I remember what my mentor then said to me then at that time. He says, Yasha, it's important to have both. Because I was now complaining about having to take the bulk of the load in terms financially. He says, you've done a great thing. But what you need to do is have lay members. You need to have working members of the church. Look, yes, your church is supposed to be a young church, but focus on having young people with jobs, young people who are focused or, or, or who are working for themselves. OK, if not, you need to empower your young people so that they may become lay members. They can become productive members of the church. This transformed our ministry. This is what brought growth to our ministry because as we empowered some of our young members, they got cars, all right? They're able to be the ones doing pickups and follow-ups. They have jobs. They're able to contribute when we need church rent. We don't have to worry about church rent for now. This, it's been a brilliant, brilliant growth process to see how God has moved us from glory to glory, to see how these that were young people that had no money, that were just students, now being able to contribute and build the church of the living God, to be able to purchase instruments and so forth. So I just want to encourage a, 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 a pastor there that's thinking or, or even a church that's thinking to themselves, we're struggling. Find a balance between the two, okay? The other thing, sorry, I'm forgetting the second point, that we had to have some maturity in the church. Maturity in the church stabilizes it because young people are very unstable. When we have some mature people, some older members who are in there, who have some solid foundations, solid understanding of the word, it stabilizes the church. My mentor said you need to have both in there in order to be able to grow the church, Hallelujah, someone. Hallelujah. So we need a combination of both. If your church is struggling, you're probably missing one of the two elements. You either have, you either have people who are just too mature and too hard to move, and you don't have enough young people who will be passionate enough to drive things forward, who are willing to take risks and try new things. Okay? Or you have young people who are just uh, young and vibrant, but don't have all right, the maturity there, and therefore you're dealing with issues of inconsistency, all right, immaturity. And, and that itself is, is, is problematic. Family, it's a powerful thing. A powerful thing. Church growth is exciting. It's exciting. Once you start understanding some of the principles, some of the concepts, some of the church growth tips and tools, whoo, boy, does it make this ministry exciting. See, family, this concept is not foreign. This is a biblical principle. We talk about the, the man who wrote most of the New Testament, the man we are following and listening to, right? The one who did the most for this, this gospel other than Jesus himself, right? Is Paul. Paul was a tent maker. We need to have tent makers in the church, amen? We need to have tent makers working for God. We need to have... Our Lord Jesus Christ himself was a laborer, okay? Some people have had disputes and, and, and arguments of whether Jesus was a carpenter or not. And, you know, there was a reference of him in the Bible, in the scriptures, that says he was a carpenter. I believe it. that's in Mark chapter 6, verse uh, 2 or 3, all right? 
So whether he was a carpenter or not, some would say, okay, uh, theology teaches us that the word is translated or the true meaning of the word is that he was a laborer or builder, okay? Or for in our modern day, he was a handyman. He was handy with his hands. So if Jesus was able to do that, we need to be able to have those kinds of people in the church. Jesus worked with his hands. Jesus was a builder, a laborer. This is how we build the church family. This is how we build the church. Scriptural principles that we can apply to our church growth, to our church growth, right? And, and listen, you may be listening to this as, as a member of the church, but this is what you should be seeing. You can apply these principles. I've always said, when we listen to messages, see where it can apply in your life. Apply it in your family, right? Apply it in your business. Apply it in your church, okay? Apply it in your life individually. This is how we build the kingdom of God. Amen. And everybody said, amen. As we carry on, what is key for church growth, right? One of the key principles to church growth is you need to be able to define who your members are. Who are your members in the church? Who are you fellowshipping with? Okay. Apply this to yourself. What kind of member of the church are you? How are you defined as a member of the church? And Pastors or ministers of the gospel, who are your members? All right, church members are mostly valuable. Well, in fact, you know they're the most valuable assets of the church. Your vision for church growth is realized as you have more and more church members. That, that's literally it. All right, that's making disciples of all men. That is scriptural. It's important to be able to count them and have accurate facts and figures at your fingertips. All right, because we can't work with phantoms and and imaginary fig- figures. And I've learned this as a young pastor. I've learned this as a young minister of the gospel. You need to know your members. You need to know them know how many they are church members are difficult to count because they come and they go easily many of them do not tell you when they come neither do they bother to tell you when they're leaving this is the truth about church and if anyone who's been in ministry (laughs) at all in any capacity will be able to tell you this Okay, even if you're a task team member, even if you're a praise and worship leader, even if you are uh, the ushering leader, you'll know that it's difficult. Some people just disappear and don't tell you when they come or go. All right. So so because of this, many churches don't have an accurate account of who really belongs to the church. All right. Uh, apart from this, many pastors cannot even tell uh, uh, where they stand in terms of their church growth vision. Okay, uh, they cannot tell you where the church, whether the, where, when the church is growing and whether they are accomplishing the vision of growth. Many pastors cannot tell you how many lawyers, doctors, fishermen, teachers uh, they have in their churches. Uh, this is important information, family. This is important stuff to know uh, because it will guide you in all your interactions with the congregation. And I've seen this. I've seen this. Understanding what my students are, where, where my people are working, where my, where my church members are working. Okay, uh, it, When you understand these principles, it, it, you, you build a stronger connection. There's, it, it's such a powerful tool here. Anyway, l- l- let me keep going. Uh, you know, so... So what we need to do in our church is make sure we have an accurate data center. <laughs> I love this. You need to have a data center with accurate information about your members. All right. I pray that your ministry through this teaching will have an accurate data center where you won't have to give vague answers about the state of the church anymore. And I love our apostle. Apostle is so, she's so detailed. She's so detailed. She loves these principles, but some of us are not grasping them. We're not grasping the, the, why they're important. And that's why we're struggling with our church growth, right? She wants accurate information for us to report what's happening. And this is not for her benefit, but for yours, for us as the, as the shepherds, for us in our churches, so that we know who we're dealing with, who's with us, who's not with us, all right? Who do we need to help? Who do we need to encourage? This is important information. And if we have this information, if the data center is up and running, there's no need to be telling lies about how many people have come to, to our churches anymore. All right. We can develop. We can develop a powerful data center for our mega churches. Amen. See, this simple process of a data center transforms your ministry, transforms your church. Okay transforms your business okay if you are not organized as apostles p always says you will agonize fail to organize you will agonize okay planning i mean failing to plan is 
planning to fail. These are the statements and words that our apostle was always saying to us continuously over and over and over and over again. But this is a principle that is being taught here. We're getting it from a, a church um, uh, from Bishop Dag Hewitt Mills who has multiple mega churches. We're talking about uh, dozens of 5,000, 3,000, 8,000 seaters. Okay. These are the principles that they use to grow the church. See, what's sad to me is that many of us will listen to men and women of God far away out there and, 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 and hear their messages as, as, as messages of wisdom and, 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 and full of knowledge and, 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 and so forth. But we cannot apply the principles, the very same principles that our apostle has been teaching us. And this is why we are not seeing church growth. This is why you're not seeing church growth, right? A very simple register of our members is crucial, will help your church grow, all right? Important information with fields like uh, gender, ages, telephone numbers, addresses, this type of stuff will transform your ministry. Amen. Okay, give uh, what you need to understand is that you must not be deceived. Many church members do not consider their membership as very important. But we as leaders of the church have to do this. We have to do this. This registration has been key to our follow-ups, key to how we, how we operate, how we move, how we're able to plan for, 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 for events and so forth. Because if you are unable to have a register, how can you contact? How can you follow up? How can you build? Beautiful. Simplicity. Simplicity to this gospel. Knowing your sheep. Knowing your sheep. The shepherd knows his sheep. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. One of the things that we have to accept in ministry and in churches is that this church membership thing is a fluid thing. It's, it's fluid in its composition, right? There are always some uh, uh, stable and unmovable people in each congregation. But it is best for every pastor to accept the absolute fluidity of the church membership. Church membership can be, can, can be described as a flowing river, <laughs> a flowing river in which the water you see today will not be the water you see tomorrow. <laughs> Let me ask you this, HPMI. The members that HPMI started with, I wasn't even there at the beginning when HPMI was birthed. Are they the same members we see today? <laughs> are they the same people we are seeing today? No. The church has been fluid in its composition, in the membership composition. It is continuously changing and flowing, right? And we need to accept this. We need to accept this. One of the things that I've learned in ministry, which is a key principle to, to growing the church, is make it easy to join the church. Make it easy. The filling out of a simple form is, 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 is an easy single procedure for joining the church. Some members insist, I mean, some churches insist on people going through various classes and procedures uh, before they are allowed to become members. This is a good idea, but you find that many will not want to go through these classes and, and, and will assume that they are not members, you know. So at HPMI, we've actually found a middle ground, which I think is beautiful. We've made it easier for some of our membership classes because we think it's important, actually, to have some foundations of a Christian, right? And then we, we teach you some foundational principles about who we are, what the church believes, and so forth, so you can understand what you are joining, all right? So we found a medium point to make it quite easy for for you to join the church at HPMI. All right. So I think we were doing well in that section, but it's important that we do that. We make it easy for our people to join. All right. Accept the reality of different levels of membership. This is another key. All right. You need to accept that reality, that reality that people in the congregation will have different levels to them. <laughs> This helped me a lot as a minister of the gospel, right? Members who are filled in a simple form, number one, all right? Number two, members who are tithers. This is number two. This is level number two. All right. And, and just for your, for your information, in, tithing indicates a level of commitment uh, and Christian maturity. It, it, it just does. Okay. Once you see someone becoming a tither, you see that there's growth. And I've seen this in my church. I've seen this in my branch. Okay. Uh, our branch, we are growing tithers. Oh, praise God. We are growing tithers. I have 
young men and women coming to me and saying, Pastor, I have my tithe for this month. Pastor, uh, I don't want to spend my tithe for this month. So can, can I just give it to you this month? Or, and I, you know, and of course, we, you know, we don't want to touch money as pastors. So I make sure I, I direct them to the right place. But, but this is exciting for me because I am seeing spiritual growth. I'm seeing maturity uh, uh, from my members here. Okay. Number three, members who participate in small groups and week, uh, uh, weekday, or in other words, non-Sunday activities. Okay. This is one of the keys to church growth. I, I, I believe it is a key, too, to church growth. Having activities during the week will grow your church. Um, uh, I don't know if I should talk about this now or later. But anyway, let me, let me, let me just carry on. And then number four, all right, uh, members who are leaders. Members who are leaders. These are the people who, in addition to all three of the, the ones that we I, I just described, become leaders and workers in the church. Right. This fourth level is very crucial because it is where the moral and ethical standards of the church can be enforced. You cannot prevent, uh, 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 for example, homosexuals from filling the forms, or drunkards, or liars, or cheaters, or thieves, robbers, rapists. You cannot prevent those. Right. Neither can you prevent uh, uh, prostitutes from paying tithe and participating in church activities. You can only preach to them and pray that the Lord shows them mercy. And this is one of the principles of our church. Except come as you are. We want them to come just like they are and let the Holy Spirit do their work as we teach and, and teach them the principles in HPMI and we, and, we, and we see the transforming power of God work in them. Uh, beautiful stuff, beautiful stuff. Okay. However, you can actually prevent a known or practicing immoral person from occupying the position of leadership. This is why this one is different. All right. This is why this position of leadership is different from the other ones. This is the only way that the integrity of the church can be safeguarded at the level of leaders, right? Leadership, leaders membership. This is where we have to really protect the church because we want the right type of people to lead the church. Okay. Another point. Here we go. All right. Registering church members can provide information, important information, which is useful in providing programs and pastoral care to registered members. All right. And I, I said this before. I touched on it before. It allows you as as a church, as those in the church who do follow ups and and prayer, those in the intercession team, you know where to pray, how to pray, you know how to follow up, you know, you know, the important things that matter to your members. OK, you we need to use computers, databases and other gadgets to manage the fluidity of the church membership, the modern church, the modern church, I tell you. Let's not be stuck in our old ways. All right. All right. Do not overextend yourself. This is another point. We mustn't overextend ourselves in the field of computerization and administration. All right. There are many uh, diversions and time-wasting traps that can cause uh, a pastor to leave his true calling. We don't want those things. All right. Just let, let's th keep things that will help us to be productive in the name of Jesus. Amen. And even for those that will do those, will, will have those responsibilities. Let's keep things that are productive and moving us forward. Okay. Uh, one of the things that cancels church growth that can can limit your church growth actually is inflating figures of membership right when you start inflating your figures it is a problem at the beginning of our uh, uh, as our at our growth uh, uh, as hpmi kairos we would see uh, certain members or people come in and there would be visitors and we'd log them in as members and then they would never come back. And so we'd have this inflated register of individuals who are not actually members of the church. All right. And so we need to have accurate figures. The pastor. All right. All right. So one of the keys to church growth family and to understanding growth. In fact, in your business, again, you can apply it to your family members. You can apply it in any area. If you take these principles, understand the principle. I'm about principles these days. Ask my branch. They tell you I'm about principles, 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 principles. OK, so what to expect from the average church member? We're going to a new section right now. All right. So let me let me tell you something. Uh, a successful mega church pastor is someone who understands the mindset of the average church member. Most pastors are too high up and they don't understand what the average church member is thinking, going through. They're so disconnected. All right. Without a clear understanding of uh, of how church members think and operate, you will not succeed in administering the church. 
<laughs> you won't. It just won't happen. The following points, uh, uh, in a general way, of course, uh, there are some exceptions. We're not saying this is the, the way it's, it's hard and fast. But uh, the, the, there's a general way that the mindset of the average church member, this is the general way. Financial planning by any administrator must take into account these realities. Uh, a successful pastor must predict certain trends and, and, and circumvent them, right? The quicker you understand and prevent these trends and circumvent them, the more successful you'll be in your ministry, all right? Uh, let me give you an example. One of the things that we're doing in our churches, one of the things that I really saw and, and God sort of pointed out to me in our church as a youth church, like I said, we have youthful problems. Okay, we're not as we, there's, there's, uh, we, there's, we have a couple of in, uh, mature individuals in our church, but for the, major, the majority, 90% uh, of the church is young people. Right. Young people. So, again, young people problems. And they are usually circulated around the same situations. Uh, drunkenness, bawa, clubbing, uh, crew vibes, <laughs> um, those kind of things. Uh, sex, fornication. This is these are the things that we're struggling with relationships. And so God spoke to me over the last uh, uh, about four, three, four months ago and told me that this is one of the things that is destroying this generation. And I wanted to cut it off at the hand. I wanted to shut it down, to shut it down before it destroyed the church of the living God was the fact that this generation is so quick to break up and make up. Divorce has become so easy for us, for our generation. I, I did a survey at my, in my branch and actually at, at some of the college campuses to ask how many have had only one relationship. And I think in the whole time I did the survey in multiple uh, locations, only one person could say that they've actually had no relationships. All right. Okay? And then I think only two said they have only had one relationship in their whole life. The rest were over three multiple relationships. So they were already experts and masters of divorce. <laughs> they already had PhDs in, and master's degrees in divorce already. And so it was important for us to address relationships and how to do them God's way using principles that we learned from the 12 foundations of marriage. Okay. L using godly pr biblical principles. Right. And I had to tell them, look, guys, we cannot expect to get godly results without godly principles. All right. And so we had to, I, I realized, we have to circumvent, we have to stop this, we have to address this, this issue right now in order for the church not to die, in order for the young people not to die, right? For them, for their destinies not to be cut short because we know Apostle Charles used to say that there are three things that are most important in this life, in this life. And if you get them wrong, any of these three things, one or, or any one of these three things wrong, you'll struggle for the rest of your life. Number one, the God that you serve. Who are you serving? Who are you worshiping? Okay. Number two, your purpose or your destiny. What is your purpose? Not your job, not your, you know, your business, but what is your purpose? Because you can be in a job and hate it and hate going to work every day. So what is your purpose? What did God create you on this earth to do? What fulfills you? What brings life to you? Okay. And then number three, the person that you are doing, number one and number two, with the person that you're serving God with, the person that you're doing, uh, that's helping you in purpose, helping you fulfill your purpose. If you cannot get these things right, it is a disaster. You'll struggle. The three get pot for those that don't know i don't want to get into that i'm diverting all right that message is so powerful that series was so powerful okay so but anyway the point was we had to circumvent that as a pastor i had to realize that this is key for the growth of my church if i do not address this my church my members will struggle will struggle amen amen beautiful here are some key facts that you need to understand about your church members all right some keys to understanding your church members most church members, number one, number one, most church members are not thinking about the church, but about themselves. That's generally why people come to church. <laughs> they are not, for the most part, the majority of them are not thinking about the church, but thinking about themselves, thinking about what God can do for them, which is okay. But, but that's number one. You need to acknowledge that, accept it, understand it, and you as a minister of the gospel will be fine. All right. You as church members, as those that are faithful and loyal, you will be fine. Number two, most members of the church spend a lot of money on themselves, but very little money on God. That is just a fact of the church. <laughs> Believe it or not. It's very true. OK, they'll spend more money on themselves than they do 
on the church of the living God or, 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 or on God. Okay. Number three, most members will find that they will spend a hundred dollars in shopping and think it's a little money. It's not enough for them to get what they actually need. But when it comes to church, it's too much money to give in the offering. <laughs> They'll spend that kind of money in the bar. Kubawa, chaiko, kubawa. Nase be tingi kruv. So, nase be tingi kruv. If it's dollars, vele, ah, it's okay. It's not, it's not even enough for what they need to do when it comes to kruv. <laughs> but when it comes to church, it's too much to give to God. Way too much for offering. Ay! Wow. Number four. Many church members do not pay tithes and they will not do so no matter what you say to them. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fact that you need to come to terms with in church. We need to understand these things. These are church growth principles. Get them, get them. Number five, if you preach about tithes, some people will pay up for a while, but most people will stop when they forget the message, all right? When they've forgotten what you said. Your financial uh, uh, planning as an, uh, as an administrator must take this into account. Don't plan on the tides of inconsistent members or on these tides of inconsistent members or inconsistent tithers. Don't do not plan on this. Number five, if you, uh, well, number six, sorry, most church members will pledge various amounts of money during fundraising events. Okay. Uh, however, most of them will not pay whatever they promised. A wise pastor must accept only the small, only a small percentage uh, of the pledged amount. This is just what this will just help you as a church, as a church, it helps your planning. Okay. Number seven, most church members are irregular in their church attendance. Woo! This for us, I think many of us will understand this. You see the Sundays you have, depending on our churches in HPMI, we have mega churches, right? Different branches out there. We want to be big mega churches, right? Mega church is a word uh, that we, we are striving towards, right? Because this is what our, our apostles, the word of God that the, the, that, that, that the apostles, um, were given by, by, by God, right? <clears throat> so we are striving for mega church numbers, right? To be a mega church. But the truth is, when we look at our numbers on the register, some days you may be, depending on the branch you are in, you may be 20, the next day you're 50, some days you may be 80, and some days you're 50, all right? Some days you may hit 200, and then other days you hit 100. It, this is the inconsistency of church attendance, okay? These members, therefore, only contribute irregularly when it comes to the ministry. And we've had to understand this at HPMI Kairos. As a young minister of the gospel, I've had to understand and accept this. All right. There are some members who will be consistent and others who will become occasionally. I see this when you're standing up there. It's easy to see um, who has come on a Sunday and who has not. You see it as a rotating system. I've noticed we can have 70 this week. We have 90 the next week. We can have 100 this week and then have 80 this week. Okay. But what is important, and it's a completely different set of people every time, almost completely different, except the consistent praise and worshipers, a couple of ushers, and a couple of the setup guys, and, and that's it. Okay. Understanding this will make your ministry grow. It will. It will. This helps you to do your follow-ups more efficiently. This helps you to see where you need to put some of your efforts as a minister of the gospel and as a church. Number eight, most church members are ignorant of the sacrifices that a pastor makes. <laughs> uh, if only people understood this. As a PK, as a pastor's kid, I have seen the behind the scenes. Uh, only we, uh, you know what, uh, let me not say only we, but we have seen the sacrifices our parents have had to make as a PK, as a pastor, or the minister of the gospel, the sacrifice, the hours on hours and hours on end that they spend ministering to, to people, giving of themselves, giving out money. Us as children many times have, have had to sacrifice as well because we didn't get certain things because our, pe our parents believed that it was more important to give than to receive. Woo! <laughs> and you know, it's easy to, 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 to judge from the outside looking in. Any good minister of the gospel, any good uh, or legit minister of the gospel is giving more than they are receiving is giving way much more than they are receiving. The sacrifices in terms of time, waking up first, being the first to get there, being the last to leave, the hours you spend praying and, 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 and travailing for the needs of the flock, 
Many times, ministers have to sacrifice their own needs so that the flock may be cared for. Many members just think that the, the pastor's duty is only on Sunday. It's for a Sunday sermon. They don't think about the rest of the week. This makes the average church member unwilling to make the financial sacrifices for the ministry. Number nine, most people are inherently ungrateful. By nature, we are ungrateful. <laughs> By nature. They benefit from the church but refuse to express their gratitude through contributions and gifts and any other thing, whether it's time, okay? The ingratitude of church members is demonstrated by the amounts of money they are willing to give to the ministry. Number 10, many church members have commitments to other groups such as political parties, old boys associations, tribal associations, professional bodies. Their commitment to these groups is Stronger is often much stronger than it is uh, for the church that they are fellowshipping at. Uh, <laughs> know that many church members will ready, readily sacrifice uh, you and your church programs for their other engagements. That's the truth. Many church members will say, no, church is last. And they'll take those other engagements first above church. That is just the truth. If you understand this principle, you will understand church growth. You will have church growth. Beautiful. Beautiful. As I wrap up, I just want us to understand a couple of principles, and I'm wrapping up here very quickly. Um, how to choose the helpers in the ministry, okay? Those that will help. Uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 2 to 3 says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Beautiful scripture. Okay, so as the church grows, a new group of people will become more important. These are the helpers uh, of ministers. These are the helps ministers, okay? we could the, uh, Bishop Dag calls them the helps ministers, or we call them task team members, okay? And those that are helping, the deacons, these are the people that, that, that are important to the ministry. At the beginning of a church, the helps ministry does not seem very important. These task team members, we call them task team members, people just doing the small things in the church. They don't seem very important, okay? Because the pastor is really the one who's the jack of all trades and has to help himself accomplish whatever he needs to. Trust me, I know about this. As a young pastor, starting a new church, I had to do everything. I was doing praise and worship, assigning, uh, uh, the, or doing the MC. Uh, doing the setup, doing the cleaning of the church. All of that was my responsibility at the beginning. At the beginning, of course, with a few other people. I'm not, please, I'm not uh, minimizing what they did and their contribution. But for the most part, I was involved in every single part of the ministry. Every part of it. All right, From the ushering uh, to, the, to, the, to the counting of the tithe. The, uh, I mean, everything, everything. This is what uh, we had to do at the beginning of a, min of a, of a ministry. But with the growth of a mega church, you you will you need people in many areas. New problems will arise, and that will require the input of helps ministers, okay, or these task team leaders, as we call them in, in, in HPMI. Uh, uh, these task team leaders are there to solve problems in many areas of expertise, all right? These task team leaders, these deacons, these ministers, these are the ones that are there to solve problems, the elders of the church. So let me describe what these type of individuals are. These are the people that build the church, okay? So these the, these people are the ones who stay in the background, who who help to uh, who help the church accomplish great things for the Lord. Such excuse me, such people are using usually administrators, secretaries, personal assistants, special aides, special envoys, okay? Uh, although these type of people are not pu publicly acknowledged, their role often converts to uh, converts a little known pastor or a little known church to a fruitful and well known uh, uh, church or a pastor. Okay, these are powerful, powerful people. The willingness uh, uh, to accept that. Uh, you need such people, these people, that we need to just be willing to accept that we need these people to build the church, all right? And to, we, we have to have the ability to successfully blend them into the ministry. This will determine how big your church will become. 
All right? And at HPMI Kairos, I've seen the need for these. There are many quiet individuals in the background who have built our ministry to, to where it is today. And we're excited. We're, and I have to testify of the goodness of the Lord. We started in 2019. We started in 2000, November of 2019. We only had four months before COVID-19 uh, hit us and, 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 and really struck our nation and the lockdowns happened. So we, we were a church really that was still fresh. But I, I, I tell many people we're, we're really just a year old because COVID-19 took a whole year away from us. <laughs> but God has been faithful. We have grown in a season where many churches have died and folded, where many branches struggled. We have actually increased in number <laughs> since we started. We started with eight. And now we're looking at a, an average attendance, weekly attendance of 80 to 100 people. During the COVID season, when we look at our register, like I said, we seem to have a rotating, a rotating uh, attendance every week. It's a different group. We have 80 this week and, and it's a new 80 every week because we have to consistently do follow ups. But what I am grateful for is the growth that we have had even in the COVID season. Beautiful, beautiful. But it is because of these that do things in the background. Those that are loyally doing follow-ups. Those that are setting up and, and doing things behind the scenes. These are the ones that are building the church of the living God. These are the ones who are making HPMI Kairos fruitful. We have to be willing to have these people that will work in the background. Build them up, strengthen them so that our church may grow. This is a great church growth principle. Beautiful. Beautiful. And so, as I close, I would like to encourage you in your church, wherever you are, apply some basic principles to your ministry. Pick a number of things. Do them well. Pick those things. Be exceptional at those things. Move on to the next group of principles. Apply them well. Be exceptional at them. And watch your church grow. God has been faithful. What I have done, what I've chosen to do, what we have chosen to do at HBMR Kairos is apply the principles that our apostles for, at, at the founding of this ministry taught us. Do those, de those deep sessions, those DIP sessions, right? Those, those, those deep uh, teachings that were so life transforming. Applying those things. We need to be a church that will apply principles in your business, in your family. If you want to see change and growth in, or change uh, or growth in your family, in your children, uh, apply the principles. Don't waver from the principles that God has established. Let's see this church change in Jesus name. So I pray, even as you hear this message, you may see that, you're, that, that God may open up your mind. The Holy Spirit may begin to enlighten and illuminate the dark areas, the gray areas of your ministry, the gray areas of your, of your business, the gray areas of your life. May He begin to bring growth to those areas in Jesus' name. So Heavenly Father, now even as we close, I thank you, Lord, that you are doing a new thing. You are growing the ministry. You are growing the church. The church is on the move. So, Lord, I pray that there may be a shifting of minds, a shifting of, 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 of hearts, Lord, that we may, be not, we may not be stuck in the same old ways. We may, we may not be insane. Those who will do this, try and do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful teaching, Lord. Thank you for the teachings of our apostles, Lord. I pray that, Lord, we may be able to apply them, apply them, apply them, apply them and see fruit, fruitfulness in our churches, fruitfulness in our families, fruitfulness in our ministries in the name of Jesus. Lord, we bind the spirit of stubbornness, a stubborn spirit, a stubborn heart. We bind that, that spirit of hardness, Lord, where we will, not, we will not be able to accept and hear and receive a word when it is taught in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that you, you begin to shape HPMI so we can be, be ready for exponential growth in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. And we are declaring, Lord, growth even in the COVID season. We're declaring growth for every megachurch, for every megachurch, wherever they are. 
in the name of Jesus, declare growth, supernatural growth, supernatural growth in the name of Jesus. We pray that they may not grow weary of doing good in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that a spirit of excitement may arise in them. Lord, the passion may arise in every mega church in Jesus' name. Let them not grow weary, Lord. Let them rise up on wings as eagles in Jesus' name. Lord, in every church in Zimbabwe, Lord, let it not just be HPMI. May the same passion, this enthusiasm, Lord, let it be infectious in the name of Jesus. We thank you. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be blessed, family. I love you all. We will see church growth in HPMI.